God. And that's the essential sin of Assyria. So in these oracles, we have um, different views on, on Assyria. Now, Assyria was called the Great Lion. Okay, that was kind of how she was known throughout the world. And so in Oracle, the Oracle in chapter two, we have this picture of the lion. Uh, if you can't see that, this is a, a battle scene um, and you can't see the lion, if you see the lion pause at the very edge um, of the, the scene where you have people in the back who are fighting off the lion and then people in the front who are fighting the enemy. And this is called the Royal Lion Hunt of the British, and this is in the British Museum, and it's from the North Palace in Nineveh, uh, estimated 645 to 635. Um, so we have this, uh, this picture of Assyria as the lion, and Great Assyria is um, often symbolized as a lion because that's how she was known. In this oracle, though, she is the lion who has become the prey. Okay, she is the one who is being fought, and she is the prey of God. There is irony in this oracle as um, they are proud of their strength and fortifications, and they're told to you know strengthen them and guard their roads and build bricks and um, collect strength and all this stuff. But then we see in verse ten that they are actually weak. None of that makes any difference. They are weak. Um, and then we also see that her, that. Nineveh's means of protection, her moats, so she had all these moats, I've got a picture later on um, of the moats. Um, the means of protection um, we see in verse six has become the instrument of destruction. We see there's this phrase cut off in verse 13 and that connects to um, the previous oracle um, in chapter one. Um, where they're cut off, and here we are, cut off again. The lion has filled its cave with its prey. Doesn't that sound like Assyria, right? She's brought people into exile, and brought all their wealth and all the stuff from all these, all these various countries. Um, she's filled her, her cave with um, all of its prey, but then in verse 13, it's cut off. She doesn't have access to it anymore. She can't get to it. Um, also in verse 13, we see Assyria's emissaries, um, the people who go out and to collect tribute, to exact judgments, all that kind of stuff, um, just disappear. They just disappear. Um, but those who call out shalom, peace, um, to Judah are heard loud and clear. Then we have Assyria the in chapter 3. Um, she is said to be luring her customers to the doom. She is luring people. She, in Proverbs 7, 27, it says, Her house is the way of Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. And that's the picture that we have of this, this prostitute. Um, Renita Wing says that the prophets used sexual language so that it depended on the end of their ability to convince their audiences that viable connections can be drawn between the norms go governing the sexual behavior of women and God's demands on Israel. Um, consequently, sexual aggression illusions uh, intend to invoke fear and repulsion. So we have this uh, oracle of Assyria as a harlot, and the whole point of it um, is to invoke fear and repulsion. Um, and then we have this um, merciless treatment. Here we go. Um, we, God's punishment is beauty is shown to be ugly and sordid. This is um, how God's punishing the harlot in this oracle. Um, her nakedness is exposed um, to show her sores. Um, merciless treatment um, to which prostitutes were subjected. That's a really, really nice way of saying rape. Okay, um, according to um, Bridgewater that I quoted earlier, she called it rape and humiliation. That's what um, is, being, is happening to the prostitute here. She's an object of scorn, and no one grieves over her death. That's what happens to this prostitute, Assyria. 
And then our, our next one is Assyria, the drunk. So this, this one is in chapter three also. Um, and one of the things that they, um, that happens here is that Nineveh is compared to thieves. I mentioned that earlier. Here we have, uh, this picture is a picture of Nineveh about the time that we're talking about. Um, and you see the moats, right? So they had a series of moats and canals that went around the, um, the city. They have fort, forts on all four sides looking over the city to protect it so that people could see um, anyone coming. They had all sorts of fortifications. Um, and yet, Thebes, which was destroyed, it was the center of Egyptian life um, from 2000 BCE uh, until it fell in 663 at the hands of the Assyrians. So here we're comparing someone who um, fell at the hands, like we, we conquered them, right? And yet the same things that they had are going to be our downfall. Thebes was also the home of the sun god um, and had all sorts of allies. We hear them referred to in this um, Libya and foot and all sorts of um, places. Um, and they were destroyed. So this is an oracle against false security, against the nation or individual who thinks that they can save themselves. Um, and that proclaiming the human might is nothing before the wrath of God. So Nineveh is relying on her boats and canals. Um, she relies on her forts and towers, and she relies on her mighty warriors, but none of that is gonna make any difference. It says, even you, even you, in verse 11, shall try to hide from an enemy like a drunkard, right? So. She's stumbling around. She's not able to control herself. Um, Assyria is drunk. And finally, we have Assyria the guilty. Um, this picture is from John Martin. It's called The Fall of Nineveh. Um, so Nineveh should prepare for siege, OK? Store up water and cisterns and jars. Make bricks to report, repair the broken portions of our walls that are knocked down by the battering rams. But it's all in vain because fire will burn her up from the insides like locusts destroying the land. So we have this opening oracle. We talked about this before. Ra'ah, no evil can stand against God's avenging wrath. And the final evil, Ra'ah, is done away. We have heaps of defenders. Remember that that heaps that heaps of gold and stuff and heaps of corpses. Now now we have heaps of defenders. Um, will do no good. So all of their might is being taken down. Verses eighteen and nineteen is a funeral dirge for Nineveh. And then you have this thunderous sound of from across the earth as the people of their um, clap for the applause of Nineveh's downfall. Um, I was going to read a thing, but I'm running out of time. So I'm not going to read that thing, but um, <laughs> it's really good. So read it later. Um, I have a couple of examples from um, history that we know well, um, our own history and part of our the history of our world. Um, of this sense of wanting to destroy evil. And I think these are important. Um, the first one is David Walker. Um, in 1829, he was a free black abolitionist, okay, in the 19th century. In 1829, he wrote this appeal um, that you see here um, to the black slaves to rise up and rebel against their white owners. Okay? so. In this case, you, we have people who are oppressed, wanting to rise up, wanting to destroy what is keeping them down, right? So we have that this sense of celebration when, when that actually happens, right? It's not at their own hand, but it is certainly um, happens. More recent example um, is, I don't know if you recognize this picture, but this is a picture of um, a plot to kill Hitler, okay? Hitler was evil, 
There were people who were actively working against him. There were, he had several attempts on his life uh, as people were, were deciding that he needed to go because evil cannot stand. Um, and um, this, this one is the, uh, the bombing of his shelter um, called outside of Rastenburg uh, called Wolf's Lair. Uh, when, when Klaus von Stoffenberg um, took a briefcase with a bomb in it into one of the meeting rooms, he was one of Hitler's advisors, um, and he placed it down on the floor next to this conference table you see, um, very near Hitler. And then he had arranged with someone to give it to call him. Um, and so he had to leave the room to take this phone call because he didn't have a cell phone. Um, and even if he did, it would have been nice for him to leave the room. Um, so he goes out of the room to take, take this phone call and he actually leaves. Um, and then uh, the bomb goes off. But Hitler was not killed because um, the guy sitting next to him kicked the briefcase and so that it moved behind the table leg and so Hitler was saved by that table leg. But other people um, were killed in this bombing and then the people who were involved, um, many of them were murdered um, by the Nazis. So this is the, the room where that happened. For us today, this is an urgent call for repentance for all of us. We stand under sentence, but God is slow to carry out that sentence. He does not wish for us to perish. We need to contem condemn ourselves for our pride and crimes against God. We need to cast ourselves on his patient mercy. We need to take refuge in his goodness, which is made flesh for us in Jesus. And we should be constantly asking ourselves if we have so corrupted our own way that we will experience God's avenging wrath. The Book of Nahum is a celebration of divine, not human, action. God will punish and eliminate evil. Why Nahum matters. God is the enemy of those who defy his lordship. And that too is goodness. For God will not allow evil to triumph in the world. Instead, he will drive it into darkness, pursue it until it disappears into the lifeless realm of chaos and void and nothingness. In short, until it is totally at an end and God's goodness alone remains on the earth. Isn't that beautiful? When God's goodness alone remains on the earth. And that's why this matters. It matters that God judges evil for what it is, and destroys it, and is hunting it like a lion, right? It matters, because what we want, what we're seeking, what we are desiring is that God's goodness alone remains on earth. And so take that with you, right? That picture of God hunting evil and chasing it out. Jesus, we are so grateful that you are here, that you love us, and that you are constantly chasing evil, that you came to release us from the power of evil. You came so that we could be together with God. Lord, help us to always remember that we are called to be drawn closer and closer and closer to you and who you are um, so that we might not be corrupted by our pride, by our um, self-sufficiency, by all of this, the stuff that distracts us and pulls us away from you, Lord. We don't want to be like Assyria. We want to be true to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.